Welcome to the next great space race, the Google Lunar X Prize. $30 million in prizes to incentivize private teams to land on the moon's surface. 33 teams have entered, but just five have been selected for $6 million of interim prizes. These milestone prizes will be awarded to the teams that can best demonstrate their ability to land safely on the moon and broadcast high-definition video back here to Earth. The $6 million can go a long way with these teams. They can use the money to put towards a launch contract, which is one of the very first steps in aiming for the moon. This portion of uh, the prize, the Terrestrial Milestone Prizes, um, are designed for the teams to show Google Lunar X Prize, or the X Prize Foundation, that they have actually created um, hardware that uh, is on a path for launching and we like to call it uh, significant progress towards launch. These tests fall into three basic categories that represent the basic major challenges of landing on the moon. First up is the landing itself, the team that can demonstrate that its lander can actually touch down safely and do so without crashing into a boulder. What Astrobotic is looking for on this test is to have confidence that their navigation system interfaces well with the Maston lander and that it successfully has a safe touchdown. We're landing near the Lacus Mortis pit. It's much rougher terrain than uh, where Apollo landed or any of the older Mars landings. We want to guarantee that we're going to be safe when we touch down. Well, this test is really focusing on the key technical challenge of the Google Lunar X Prize which has only been successfully done by three government agencies in the past, and no private companies have ever done that. They are testing the precision guidance uh, of the, uh, the sensor packages that they have on board. And this technology has pretty much been used and tested in robotics, so it's more uh, the application of this technology. So for this flight, the critical part of the code that I wrote was the landing site selector. So what that software does is, is give it an estimate of where the rocket is with respect to the potential landing zone. And given probabilistic estimates of rocky regions versus flat regions, it takes that classified data from other software and picks the final actual coordinate destination to send to the vehicle where the Maston vehicle takes over and guides the rocket to that landing spot. Astrobotics is actually going to fly other teams to the surface of the moon, so that's an interesting approach. So they're taking other payloads with them, as well as their own. From touchdown to mission complete for GLXP, that's the, that's the final moon cost, that, that would be about five Earth days. And we are of course planning for more surface operations once the initial GLXP moon cost is completed. We built a volumetric prototype for a lander. It gives the sizing, the placement of the various components. And at another facility, partner facility, we're doing the imaging system. We're not trying to, you know, uh, figure out anything dramatically new. Uh, the mission itself is dramatic, so let's not try and get in too many, uh, you know, fantastic uh, theories in there. So, so it's it's a classic. We go into an Earth parking orbit, which the launch vehicle uh, puts us into. Uh, that's a 55,000 kilometer apogee orbit. We're taking three orbits there, then we're switching to a lunar orbit, a couple of orbits there, then we begin descent. Uh, the final descent burn is about nine minutes, nine to ten minutes, and then we touch down. We'll be able to get that money shot, that, that pick of the moon and the earth from a million miles out. That'll be a great pick. And then we'll fall back on the moon, we'll go in orbit about the moon, take a breath, make sure the spacecraft is healthy, and, and once we have the confidence, we'll give it the signal and we'll go in. And that landing sequence will be pretty fast, less than 10 minutes for sure. And uh, we'll be hitting our brakes, going down to the surface of the moon and landing on our thrusters. So what we're testing today is the very first of our field tests with it. Uh, we're doing what's called a moist test, which we put a hydrogen peroxide in the tanks 
and we actually uh, check to see that all the systems are, are a go. This is more of a technology risk reduction than it is a replication of any landing scenarios. Flying anything that's complex like this is a feat in and of itself. And so what we accomplish is, for one, we have a thruster that's very similar to in, in both the type and the design to what will fly on the actual flight model. We have the actual flight software that we will fly. So how we de determine where the spacecraft is sort of depends on where it is in its mission phase. When we're out in deep space transiting to the moon, uh, we'll mostly be relying on um, what are called star tracker images. So we take an image of the stars and then using the known locations of the stars in the celestial sphere, we can figure out where the spacecraft is pointed. So in a combination of work on the spacecraft and work on the ground, figure out where it is and where it's pointed. Next up is imaging, where the team demonstrates that it has the ability to broadcast high definition video across space back to Earth. To demonstrate sort of very high resolution and high frame rate video is something that is not that easy to do. So this is the first test of part-time scientists imaging subsystem and so today part-time scientists is attempting to demonstrate that their imaging system is capable of capturing high quality still images. In later tests they'll move into moving images with, uh, with potentially having a rover mounted camera or some sort of moving camera moving through the scene and also demonstrating the pan tilt mechanism. But today it'll be still images and they're pointing their camera at, at targets. Um, targets for colour and also for image quality. The reason why you saw us putting up different filters in front of the camera is actually because we're having, mixing two different types of cameras. So we're having two black and white cameras, which are the, the parallel ones. They were the ones for the stereoscopic imaging that we used to do this 3D scanning of the surface and measuring distances to certain focal points. And then we have, of course, the uh, telelens, which is in the middle. And the telelens is actually different in a way that the, the other two cameras actually already color sensors. So they are capable of seeing color themselves. But the telelens is a black and white sensor. The point is the quality is better if you use a black and white sensor and apply the right kinds of filters. So the reason why we come here to the DFKI Institute is because they have this very awesome space hall which is capable of simulating realistic lunar lighting conditions. This moonscape has a few interesting properties. One of them is that it's optically realistic, so they have the right colour and the, the right formation of the surface to give the shadowing effects and the lighting effects that uh, a camera on the moon would actually be looking at. In these tests, no, it won't be simulated. Uh, they will be gathering the data and analyse it overnight. I would say without doubt that there is rather more work to be done before they qualify for the, for the cash prize, but this would be for them a, a big step in the right direction. We need to prove that the resolution of the images are good enough to drive, that the compression that's required to get all that data down doesn't destroy the images, uh, and that we can take nice high color HD images of the beautiful things that we're going to see on the moon. Yeah, so right now we're looking at the user interface for our prototype moon rover. On it, we can see the images that are fed to it. Those are used to uh, control the rover, and the higher definition images are streamed back to Earth for the viewing of the public. We're measuring the resolution. We're looking at the focus at various different ranges, looking at the signal and the noise. The astrobotic systems, uh, exp nice because it has a stereo sensor, so two cameras on it, it can generate 3D information. The two cameras give us uh, stereo video. On the moon, the appearance is a little different. It's very gray, it's very flat. The sunlight's very bright, and so it's hard to tell distances. On Earth, you use things like the bluing of the mountains very far away to understand how far things are. We use the stereo cameras to be able to tell distance to things like rocks and craters so we don't get stuck. They pass all the requirements with one camera, and now they have two, so they're more than twice as good for the camera. Once we've landed, we'll be taking some video and some high-definition imagery. Uh, wherever possible, we use consumer technology and upscale it or upgrade it to space qualification. So with imaging, we're going to be using some commercial cameras that we've modified. Uh, and environmentally tested. 
and this will be very cool because they are extremely capable and relatively inexpensive and we'll be flying these things for the first time to another world and uh, when we announce uh, what those cameras are I think people will be pretty excited about it. Finally there's mobility showing that the team can cross 500 meters either above, on, or even below the surface of the moon. Hakuto has decided to use these sand dunes as much like the uh, lunar surface and to go through some of the different paces that the rover will see to include communications as well as mobility. And this is an off-the-shelf camera for industrial use, pointed straight up. And so there's also a parabolic mirror so the camera can see a 360 degree image all the way around. The live raw image from the uh, Omni camera here so we can see in front of the rover to the right and behind. I'll show you a spot turn. We're going to turn 30 degrees to the right. Yeah, so in the front here, this is a 3D scanner, so it works with the laser. We have processing on board the rover that can detect the slope of the ground in front of the rover, detect if there's a pit or a rock. Then we can come to an emergency stop, tell the operator that information so they can make a decision. After landing, we send a signal from the ground station, then envelope should open, then rover should go out from the envelope, then touch on the surface of the moon, and then travel more than 500 meters. This team um, has done a very good job of understanding what the requirements are and answering those requirements in a very methodical way. They had to design a, an envelope that will fit on a lander and they had to deploy that envelope going through different vibration and environmental tests. And then of course they had to work with commercial off-the-shelf hardware not meant for uh, space environments and working through the problems of keeping it thermally stable, allowing it to operate in much more um, austere kinds of places. Solution to the X Prize requirements is Moonraker, the larger of the two. They have a secondary um, set of objectives that don't have anything to do with X Prize, and that is to look into what are termed lava tubes on the moon. So they've created a second rover, a much smaller one, that can trail behind, and at some point the smaller Tetris will be lowered into a lava tube in order to collect um, different kinds of data. The rover has a suspension that allows it to drive at low speeds very capably. It's a single pivot suspension, so it's got one pivot up front and then all of the rest of the suspension is fixed. So as it drives over rocks, the wheels will lift and the body will average. It doesn't do anything for dynamics, but because we're driving so slowly, uh, it's a very capable suspension. From the Earth to the Moon, we have a signal propagation delay of 2.5 seconds. So when we send a command from Earth, it takes 2.5 seconds to reach the moon and from the moon the, the image feedback that gives the result of that action would be another 2.5 seconds so we press a button to make the robot do something then we see it five seconds later so we have to plan for that in our driving strategy. Our rover is small, so it's, it's four wheels. Uh, all four wheels are powered, the front two wheels have steering. It has a collapsible mast. Uh, it is powered using solar panels, relatively small. Overall dimensions would be about half a meter by half a meter by 40 centimeters. So it's, it's almost a, a, a cube. A four-wheeled rover is much more efficient out there in the field because it can do more exploring. From our definition, the rover can move 360 degrees from the top perspective in any direction. There is no back and forth, no right side, left side. That gives him a great way of flexibility and freedom to move. And that means he won't get stuck easily. And I think that's the special thing about it. Also, it has an active suspension system, which means he can lift and lower single legs. So after we've landed and after we've done what we need to do with our other science instruments and with our Google and Prize cameras, we're going to take off again and we're going to fly across the surface of the moon at least 500 meters, maybe more, and land again and do the same thing. Take some panoramic images, some HD video, and that will be the first extreme jump off planet. The vehicle must know not only how to land but then also how to take off again. However, landing the second time should be easier based on what we've learned from the first time. 
So we will be trying to do, um, if we're taking images of the surface of the moon on our way in the first time, try and use as much of that data as possible to make a smooth path for the spacecraft uh, the second time when we go to land. The milestone tests are completed, the money has been awarded, but there's still a long way to go before the first team collects $20 million in its place in history as the first commercial team to land on the moon. I'm Tim Stevens from CNET covering the Google Lunar X Prize.